boyfriend, baby. Excelsior! What's up, horror fiends? It's your boy, Ricky Grimes. Welcome back to the Comic Book Horror Show, issue number five. Thank you for joining us. And of course, we got my boy, my co-host, Joe the Psychologist. What up, son? What's up? What's up? Uh, ready to talk this one. Um, you know, I'm, I'm one of those few that saw this when it came out in the theater. I don't know if you guys did, but I know I saw this one in the theater. And so, yeah, looking forward to this one. You know, it's a Marvel movie, another one. Yep. And in case you haven't noticed, we got a very special guest. We finally <laughs> got my boy, my brother, JR, on the Comic Book Horror Show here on Horror Fiend TV, The Boss. What up, JR? How you doing, bro? My man, I had to come on to this one. I mean, Joe actually admitted he watched one Marvel movie in the theater. Oh, good call. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I did watch. Uh, I, can take back. I watched the X Men ones, but yes. This was really? probably the first. This is the first. Um, actually, yeah, I guess this was the first Marvel movie I saw in the theater. So, damn yeah. it, man, who doesn't want to talk? You got me. Yeah, I got <laughs> you, man. And then you admitted for more. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> you watched the worst ones, anyways. Um, <laughs> yeah, oh uh, yeah. Was, I mean, who doesn't want like you know talk about comics, especially this one? Yeah, comics and horror, they go together like peanut butter and jelly. We are going to be discussing Blade from 1998. The film is directed by Stephen Norrington and it is written by David S. Goyer. The film stars Wesley Snipes as Blade, Stephen Dorff as Deacon Frost, and Chris Christopherson as Whistler. Guys, let's take it back though. This is based on a comic book character. Let's let's be real. It's a D character to begin with. This guy was created back in 1973. Issue number 10, July, The Tomb of Dracula. How awesome is it to like debut in a book called Tomb of Dracula? That's almost as good as debuting in Werewolf by Night. You know what I mean? Uh, but we're talking Blade. He was created by Marv Wolfman and Gene Colan. Like I mentioned, he was a supporting D-list character. Big shades, colorful outfit, big afro. His weapons were crosses, garlic, spikes. Very one-dimensional. It wasn't until 1998 when they took this character out of obscurity pretty much. Decided to make a film out of him. And what's good about it, he didn't have the baggage that would like a Superman would have or like, you know, a Spider-Man, let's say Batman. So they could have free reign to, to do whatever they want. We got a dark R-rated film here. Mind you, this predates The Matrix. So this film here broke barriers and ways that oh, yeah. a lot of people are not really aware of whatsoever. And um, yeah, if it wasn't for Blade, we wouldn't probably be here talking about comic book movies. So well, we got a lot to discuss in this. Episode. As you said, Deadpool, Deadpool was not the because I think this is rated R. So Deadpool yeah. was not the mm -hmm. first rated yeah, R. It was Blade. Yeah, it was Blade. So Swamp Thing was PG. <laughs> Swamp Thing was PG. Swamp Thing was PG. <laughs> and you know, it's funny. Just uh, the guy who directed this, he also does makeup, and um, he did makeup on a movie that I got wind might be coming up on something. It's called Feast. Did you know that? Feast? He did. He did. A, yes, wait. sir. He directed Feast. No, he did. Um, he does, does, makeup. does makeup. He does makeup. Makeup. He's I never known heard for of that makeup. movie. I, I gotta check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Blade is a daywalker, which kind of sets him apart from other vampire type of characters. Joe, you are a resident Blade fanatic here. You read him more than me. I don't know about Jr., but chat me up, bro. A uh, blade and uh, the daywalker. The way that blade became to be was his mother was bitten by a vampire. So as she's giving birth to him, the he basically got the vampire blood in him also. So or the vampire infection, whatever you want to call it, and that's how he became a daywalker. So he's half human and half vampire. As Deacon says, you know all the strengths of the um, vampires and none of their weaknesses which is what made the character stand out. I mean, he had done many missions in the comics with you. He's helped out the Avengers. I mean, when, when Avengers, even the um, X-Men, anything involving supernatural, somehow he's brought in. And I want to say, especially now that we've got the Marsala Ali's version coming up, that um, in the comics, you're starting to notice that they're changing his, like the way he looks, he's a little bit more slimmer, not Wesley Snipes big. Um, but he's getting a resurgence again. And it's just, you know, that this movie has been around for years. 
and was one of, for me, at least I remember the first one showing you a, a day walker because we've seen him in other movies um, after that. Um, but yeah, just being a vampire that you're able to kick ass, you can't get hurt and you can walk in the sun. I mean, how cool of a character could you be? So that's why, like, when you said D, I always found him, I mean, I, but I'm the supernatural person, too, and I love vampire stuff. So I had always loved the um, Blade comic. I had collected it. I did the Midnight Suns uh, run. Junior um, read those because it crossed over with Ghost Rider, mm -hmm. Doctor Strange. Um, I think Spider-Man jumped in there. So um, that's what made, the, like, out of all the vampires we've seen is because he's a daywalker, so he stands out amongst all the other vampires. The one thing I love about Blade being a daywalker is how all the other vampires are fucking jealous of him. <laughs> 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 so, so, JR, uh, how familiar are you with the character? I'm not, I'm well, not sure. Well, reading Ghost Rider, I mean, they, they've had countless crossovers, even before the Midnight Suns. They, they were constantly yeah. working together. Um, the character's always been, like you said, the D character's always been intrigued at the fact that they took this film, and mind you, Wesley Snipes was at the tail end of his, his run. He was starting to make so-so films. Yeah. I mean, he was, he had the high of, um, White Man Can't Jump. I mean, I like the movie, but people don't like Demolition Man. I thought he was great in Demolition Man. I, 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 I love Demolition, love Demolition Man. Man. <laughs> I love Demolition Man. That's an awesome movie, too. Yeah, but he was at the tail end, starting to drift off, and then he pushed for this role too. He liked the Blade character as well. So, you know, when you have a, somebody who actually loves a character, researches the character, studies the character. the character. Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're comic book junkies, but you could tell sometimes when the person plays a character that they haven't researched that, you know, they're, they're, they're not really becoming that character. <laughs> Swamp Thing. <laughs> Swamp, Swamp, thing. <laughs> Swamp Thing is a perfect example, but yeah. But, I mean... His character has always been intriguing. And the fact that, you know, you put in the whole Daywalker thing. Because, yeah. it, you know, a lot of comic people like, you know, Morbius. He's always freaking vampire. You know, can't can't go in their daytime. You know. And his his uh, physical appearance didn't change, too. Which I like that, too. Because they're going to win something and change, you know, when he raged. It's just something totally different. But the fact they toned it down, they kept him. I mean, Steve, I mean, um, Deacon Frost said, you know, you have the best of both worlds. Because, yeah. you know, they were, they were, they were all, I mean, and, and before Deacon Frost had his plan, in reality, he wanted to partner up with Blade because them two together, you figure, you know, they could, they could take over everything. Day and night. They yeah. Can't yeah. Go day and so, night. No, the Daywalker was a very interesting thing. And the only film I could say that I'd try to do the same shit, fuck you, Twilight. The vampires in this movie, like I mentioned, they're all fucking jealous of fucking Blade. Mm -hmm. And now you got that one vampire that stood out. Quinn was <laughs> Quinn. Oh, I love Quinn. <laughs> awesome. Quinn. Uh, awesome. Donald Donald Logue. Donald Logue, the great there. Donald Logue. Yeah. Awesome. And he had a bunch of other bit players that were in there too that kind of stood out. Like talk to me about the vampires in this film. What what how did they separate these vampires from previous vampires of other horror films? Well, the first thing they did is they separated the elders of the the, the true bloods versus the people who were turned. And what you got in this film is the people who are turned are the ones that are understanding the change that's going on. I think one of the good aspects of this film is the fact that they separated the vampire clans in a way. You had the older generation, the true blood, who like to live in the shadows, like the, the partnership they had with the humans, where you had the new generation with Deacon Frost, who, why are we submitting to these humans? There are food. You know, we should be dominating them. The, the True Bloods, they like to stay in the shadows undercover. The new vampires, they freaking have, was a, a, a party where they have blood coming out from the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Which is where you bring in, some, you bring in some fresh, bring in some fresh meat for that. Yes. Great, great scene in that. Yeah. And the fact that Quinn. He was coming off his role as the dad in Titus, which was a good series that was comedy that was coming out. And um, I think it was ABC. Titus was before Fox. this. It was Fox. Wow, I thought it was, it was after. Yeah, it was Fox. I was saw Fox. that one too. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so it, he, this is where it, his character was similar to the role he was playing in, in that show. He was but, always getting fucked up in that show too. Oh, he, he, he was always funny. He didn't, he didn't care. I mean, he was the, the, the perfect um, sidekick for Deacon Frost. Yeah. Because he took the whole joking, he took the whole 
you know, look at me, I'm a vampire, do whatever I want, ha, 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 you know. I mean, think about it. The, the, the whole time he was pissed off was Blade because he took his arm. I mean, both. <laughs> he took his arm. That's the only reason he was pissed. He wasn't pissed that he burned him. He was pissed he took his hands. I mean, when they go back to that scene, that scene where they're in the freaking underground part where the, the film really kicks off. I mean, come on, you had Tracy Lords and Raquel. Yeah. Mercury was, I mean, I love Mercury. I, I wish we had a little bit more of her in the film, which I think they try to do it in a way in the third one to try to remake this character. In the she third came one. back in the third one? No, but oh, the way her character was, Mercury was, was the way Parker that Posey's character. Parker was. Posey's character was in, in the trilogy, but yeah, I mean, I, I think they did the vampires perfectly in this film. They, they made them more action, like be able to do more fights. In the comic books, they were vampires. They were a lot more scarier. So they didn't go with the scary route. It was more of an action type of movie. Right, right. Um, but so you less did, thirty days a night and more, you know. And, well, it's funny more. because as I'm watching it, and unfortunately that movie bounced in my head, we and just I'm did like, it too long. man, I, I may, I just wish maybe they were just a little bit more violent and more aggressive. You seeing them bite more. Um, I liked Pearl, the big fat one that was working with Deacon. Like, you know, just to see that a vampire can get so fucking fat. That Jabba the Hutt <laughs> fucking yeah, looking motherfucker. That's Pearl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, his name is Pearl because it was a he. Oh, that's um, right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah. My only little knock on it, honestly, is that, um, especially with the older ones, like, I didn't understand how easily they were all subdued by Deacon's people. Because they're so strong, they're they're older. They should be stronger. Yeah, they're elder. So yeah, yeah like they barely fought. They should like, be I, smarter too. They can't thank be. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I kind of felt like because here's this council, and you know, Deacon's just fed up that he's been doing all the work for them to make money. You know, they get to sit back in this little quiet life. But that was like the only thing. Like in that scene, I get, you know, because ultimately, um. Blade's daywalker thing comes into play when they need the other vampires in order for Deacon to basically do um, La Magra, I think it was it was called, yeah. so he can become stronger. But I'm sitting here going, you guys have been around for thousands of years and you guys, none of you guys can fight? I mean, literally, in thousands of years, you didn't have the time to learn how to fight? So, like, honestly, that's the only thing I didn't like is that the council itself was a little bit weak. They watered them down. They watered them down. When you mentioned the vampires here where you wanted them to be more visceral, like in the 30 days a night. One thing that this film did that was kind of different to me is they took the vampire aspect of these characters and grounded them. I think that's what made the movie connect more with the a casual audience too. Yeah. Because these vampires were just you know, if you go to East Main Street, this is where you see people <laughs> acting like, you know what I'm saying? So instead of being like thugs and, and, and what, you know, what have you, they're, they're vampires. So I, I like that because they're not just monsters. They're just regular people that are vampires walking amongst everyone. Not during the day, obviously, but uh, that's a very good contrast to the comic book hokey and colorful and, you know, yeah. uh, cliched. I think this one took it and grounded it in a way where it set it on its path to kind of save the Marvel universe. Because let's be real, before this movie, Marvel was kind of on a decline. Marvel had to sell the X-Men, Spider-Man, Fantastic Four. They got rid of all those rights, yeah. Hulk, because they were going bankrupt. And Blade was the very first movie that took off. It it, it was a very small budget and made a, and it made his money back like quadruple and still know? making the money yeah. though that's the whole thing yes. it's still making it yeah money. It, it took a character like blade who like i mentioned he's goofy as fuck in the books before this and you mentioned how now they got the current blade how them you thin the mountain and stuff before this he was goofy once wesley snipes took over what did blade look like in the comics More wesley like snipes him. year after this x-men comes out right instead of having colorful costumes they grounded them in the leather the black leather like it or not but they don't they wanted to make them feel more organic and more real as opposed to having a co colorful spandex. That comes from Blade as well. This film here, it, it definitely took, it say the MCU, but it is the birth of the MCU. Iron Man, let's say he took off, right? To start the MCU. Now, Iron Man, when he that film came out, wasn't a big character at all. He was bigger mm -hmm. than Blade. Honestly, yes, he was. He was an Avenger for, for crying out loud, but he was still be almost C-level at best. He, Tony Stark was not a popular character within the no. Marvel 
comics universe, right? Once you know but his history. Once Robert Downey, you mentioned Wesley Snipes. Joe, uh, Jr. mentioned it. Wesley Snipes, the Blade kind of saved his career in a sense, mm -hmm. just like Iron Man saved Tony Stark. Oh, well, Iron Man saved Robert Downey Jr.'s career yeah. in a sense because he got a second chance with that character, and Wesley Snipes is almost in that same boat. And again, this predates all these movies by so much, and I don't think it gets the love it deserves. I recall sitting in the movie theater and like literally people clapping at the end. Like there was, everyone was so happy with this movie. Like it was a lot of fun. I mean, if you're, in, I, I like that type of music. So you got that soundtrack going and you're like, you know, your head's bobbing to it and you, you know, you, you see the dancing and all that violence. So it was, yeah, it was a breath of fresh air. You wanted to be in that room, right? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Before the blood though, before the <laughs> before blood. Before the blood. <laughs> yeah. I would have been out. I mean, the minute, like I, the minute I started noticing things were a little off because I would be looking around and we still do anyway. I would have been out really quick somehow. Yeah. And that's another thing. It's R rated, but it ain't R rated for like language. This is a violent fucking movie. Yeah. You know, and a lot of blood and, and, and a lot of gore in a sense. And Blade was very charismatic. Wesley Snipes took that role made it his own bro well it was smart because they took a film they took a character that had no expectations so yes, yeah. the expectation was in there if they would have went out with a different character like nothing say, to lose yeah yeah nothing to lose. so they went on and the fact that it's, it's still a character connected to horror i think helped it even more oh yeah oh yeah you know mm -hmm. that horror element is always going to bring fans in and you know you have a film where like i said you know wesley snipes telling of his career now think about this this is show you the difference of this was is when this film came out, everybody was excited about it. Everybody watched it. It saved the MCU. They tried to repeat it years later by doing a Blade series with Sticky Fingers from Onyx. And <laughs> it didn't go too well. Did you I watch watched it? it. I watched I, it. I, I tried. I, wa I, I watched, watched, watched the whole thing. It. Yeah. I've, I've never because seen it. You just couldn't do it. So they try to, they try to bring you know bring that little magic back, and they couldn't even do that because Wesley Snipes is that character, and you know, as far as it did say the MCU, because the MCU was, well, it was Marvel Studios at the time. Marvel yeah. Studios, you're right. Yeah, yes. it was Thank Marvel you, Studios at the time. So they were, and then, you know, the comics were in trouble because, and it, you know, unfortunately, during the, during the 90s, people weren't big into comics as we were in the 80s and early 90s. The late 90s, people, you know, everybody who was collecting comics grew up. Yeah. So people were forgetting these characters. And then, you throw the character, no expectation, blew everybody out of the water, saved Marvel Studios, gave them the, the energy to a couple years later, all right, let's do Iron Man. When Blade went to fight Deacon, the final fight, he did the first superhero pose. Yeah, good out. show, good show. Because literally when he did it, I go, there it is. Everyone has mimicked Everyone that says. one. And as soon as you know, he went down, he did that look up. I'm like, everyone, every superhero has done the drop and the look up, and fucking Blade was the first to do that one. I would die on a hill for this. If it wasn't for this film, we would not be here today no. talking about all these films. Because there's movies before that were good. Ah, the original Superman, Batman. But those were yeah. like, they weren't, again, they felt like comic book movies. They were still cheesy in a sense, which they were meant to be. And not always in a bad way. Well, they were a big Blade. Budget. Blade modernized it, though. They took it and made it for a modern audience. It was cool and hip all of a sudden to like a comic book movie. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be, that's all I got to say about that. All right, JR, just keep in mind that we're doing the mutant power levels for our ratings. All right. So Epsilon would be a one, Beta is two, Alpha is three, Omega is four. That way, when you go to give your rating, that's the power level of this movie. It's a comic book horror show, man. The we comic need, book. We, we got to get it. Yeah, we, we got to do power level. level. We got to keep a comic book, man. I mean, this one's Omega. I mean, it's, it's Omega all the way. I mean, it's a great film. I mean, uh, the storyline is good. The action is good. The cast is amazing. I mean, it's does not. I mean, to kind of counter Joe's argument earlier, I think the reason the elders were the way they were is because through all these years, they became domesticated. By having to deal with the humans. All right. So they forgot what it was like to have that primal like feeling and that feeling of superiority because you know, they were always more concerned about breaking the balance, breaking this partnership 
that they didn't want to risk anything, which I think added a better element to it because the fact that you had Deacon Frost want to forget about the old ways. And even told him, you know, you're, you're not going to make it till you know, to see how things are going to change. So he already told him he's, he's dead Yeah. earlier in the movie. So, and Deacon Frost, even though great character, I mean, even the scene where, <laughs> I don't know how much he put on himself, but he put all the sunblock. You know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of sunblock all over himself <laughs> to walk during the day. Which, which is amazing because he, he and it worked, won- it, it worked, worked and yeah. You know, I didn't mean, miss a single spot, he didn't, he didn't play any around his eyes. But but the fact that he was willing to do that in order to experience what it was like to walk out during the daytime that he forgot what it was like, but no, definitely it's Omega. I mean, this, this film did save the MCU, and if you don't think it did? Then I don't know what other films you thought saved the MCU prior to this one. Yeah, I agree, one thousand percent. Joe, the psychologist. All right, I, I, I'm also. An, it's so it's funny because my one little draw was the elders and Junior's comment. If you didn't come up with this, Rick, my rating would have been a little bit less on this one. So <laughs> listen, I'm also listen. going Omega on Even it. Even the most perfect film has flaws. So. It does have flaws. Yeah. But somebody, but it's it's when you hear a good counter to yes, it. Yes, I agree. And yeah. so you're right. So basically, because at this point, they've no longer been attacking people to feed. Yeah. They've mm-hmm. been given their blood. You know, they're, they're they, basically they domesticated. Yeah. yeah. So they don't have that drive or strength anymore. Oh. Good point. You bring that up. That's where mine is an Omega. I mean, I love this movie. It, it, it's it's it watched it again before we did this. I think I picked up my phone twice just to see. And I've seen this movie so many times. But again, when if you can keep your phone down during a movie, even a movie that you've seen more than a handful of times, that's how good the movie is. Yeah. And unlike Swamp Thing, <laughs> this stood up the test of time and yes. still does mm-hmm. adam pointed out the special effects are still good he goes and, and the cgi heavy special- cgi yeah. film yeah. by the way we, we know we how we feel about cgi right and jr goes wow the special effects that they used then still look good now and i'm like i was thinking that as i was thinking how bad swamp thing was compared <laughs> which I, that's why i wanted to bring up how you know, this movie, 1998, what's that? Almost, God. what, 35 years I now? I just graduated high school when that shit came out. Yeah, so if, I think, what, am I, am I math wrong? I think 35, 25 or 35, one of those two. Yeah. Either way, 25, all right. It's 25 years old, and the special effects still hold up. So, yep, it's an Omega for me. Yeah, me too, Omega all the way. This film is great, even if, it, even if we're not talking about the ramifications that will be felt much later as far as, you know, business and and saving the studios and even pumping up Wesley Snipes, bringing him back into the fold. This film is great. You sit there and watch it. It's two hours, but it goes by fast. You're never bored. And this character of Whistler, awesome character. Uh, Chris... Uh, Christopherson, singer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. became an actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was so good, man. And uh, you mentioned like the, even the big players like, you know, Quinn, Mercury, Raquel, all these characters. Pearl, oh my God. Like, how like how can you forget that character? Like, holy <laughs> shit. It's a good film. And the CGI, it, it's there. It's in heavy abundance as well, yeah. but it's not distracting. It's done in a no. way where it, it fits the world. And it looks really, really, really good. So this is an Omega. I love this fucking movie. Dude, good shout. JR, thank you, my friend, for coming on to this episode of the Color Book Horror Show. We got to get you back on, sir. Joe, take us home, my brother. All right. Join us next time. And until then, we are out. (laughs) 